Dear friends in Christ, grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Prepare our hearts, Lord, to receive your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that in hearing we may believe, and in believing we may obey your will revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Question for you. Do you like surprises? Kind of all depends on what the surprise is, right? So maybe I should qualify that. I don't mean surprises like an audit from the IRS or that noisy clanking sound in your car's engine, right? I'm talking about good surprises. Surprises like a birthday party with a, uh, your favorite people or a surprise visit from grandpa and grandma or the grandkids. A surprise vacation to somewhere warm during a cold, long, dark middle, uh, w middle of a Minnesota winter. Those kinds of surprises are great, right? My wife and I started a silly tradition with our kids when they were young. Every once in a while, we would announce that we were taking them on a special field trip. But they didn't get to know where we were going, especially because we would blindfold them and then put them in the car. We'd, with our eyes secured tightly, we would buckle them in and drive off to wherever we were taking them for someplace fun. Now, Back in those days, one of their favorite places to go was Chuck E. Cheese's. Raise your hand if you've ever been to a Chuck E. Cheese's. Now raise your hand if you are like me and you promise to never go to another one after that, right? It was, just, it, it was great in its day, but no more. Another favorite place for our kids to go was to this uh, dinner theater where you get to sat around a, uh, a table and ate your supper all while watching a movie on a big screen. We got some funny looks and some shakes of the heads, a lot of smiles from other families as we forced our kids to stand in line blindfolded while we waited to go in. Luckily, no one ever arrested us for child endangerment or being abusive parents. God has a big surprise in store for Abraham and Sarah. One day, while they're just minding their own business, living their lives in an area that's now Iran or Iraq, the Lord appears to them and says, get ready because I have a deal for you, a big surprise. You're going on a trip. And on top of all that, I'm going to give you three amazing blessings. I'm going to give you a, lead you to a land that will become yours to live in. I'm going to make of your people a great nation. And I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you so that through you, all the nations of the world or the families of the world will be blessed. Pretty cool deal, right? There was no contest. Abraham and Sarah didn't have to convince God to pick them. They didn't have to pass a test or pay a fee. They didn't have to promise that they would do their best to make sure this happened. All they had to do was get up and go. So they tied everything to their camels and they got up and they went. They headed west to find this place that God had promised to make their own. Now, it's safe to say that things did not start out the way that you or I would have wanted, nor was it how Abraham and Sarah wanted either. When they got out west, they discovered that although God had promised to ultimately give them this land, Abraham and Sarah were going to have to work hard to make it their own. And they discovered that even though God had promised to give them descendants, they were going to have to wait a very long time to even begin to see that promise unfold. And even though God had promised to bless them and bless the world through them, Abraham and Sarah needed to learn that God did not intend to make that blessing happen overnight. But the fact is, the very lifeblood of our relationship with God is founded on the premise of a promise. It's affirmed in the story that we heard last week. Pastor Mike did a great job of explaining how the rainbow was the symbol of God's promise than, uh, to never again destroy the world by a flood. But even more than that, the very lifeblood of our relationships with each other is also founded on the premise of a promise. In a moment, we're going to take a look at the relationship between God and us, but let's start with something very tangible, something concrete, something real, something that might just make you a little nervous. I want you to reach into your pockets or purses or whatever and pull out something in your wallet or purse that depicts a promise, okay? Wallets and pockets and purses, oh my. 
What's something in your wallet or purse that carries a promise? Something that either you promise to do, or it's something that the item promises to let you do. Anybody have an idea? Driver's license. What does that allow us to do? Drive without getting arrested, right? Okay, very good. And if you had any money in your wallet, let's see if I do. Yeah, I do. Okay. What does this allow me to do? Buy something worth five bucks, right? Yeah. So there's, a, the, there's an inherent promise in each of these things in my wallet. Um, there are other symbols in our lives that also carry promises. Can you think of others that aren't in your wallet? How about the ring on your finger? It's a promise, right? It's a promise to remain faithful. How about the symbol of what I'm standing under? The cross is promise, God's promise to, uh, to bless us all. Class ring, you know, all those things. We have uh, lots of things in our lives that have a promise attached to them. Either to us, a promise to us, or a promise by us. Each agreement, each contract, each covenant carries with it an explicit benefit if it's honored and a specific consequence if it's not honored. Here are some examples of, from my childhood. As long as you're living in the house, these are the rules. Do you ever hear that from your parents? Here's another one. Ignorance of the law is not a defense. Click it or ticket, till death do us part. From timeouts to jail time, from probate court to divorce court, we all know the pain that comes from promises that are broken, either by us or on us. So Abraham and Sarah have been living with this amazing promise and nothing good happens for year and year and year in and year out, many, many years. What does needing to wait feel like to you? What's the old saying? Watch pot never boil. It's called in some instances delayed gratification. Do you remember needing to save your pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters and dollar bills to buy something that you really, really wanted and your parents wouldn't let you get it until you had all the money? Now, we Americans aren't that big on waiting for what we want or even getting help for what we need. We want our problem fixed and we want it fixed now. Delayed gratification, no thank you. Think about Abraham and Sarah to have been given a promise that something wonderful, three wonderful things were, were going to happen, and then have to wait and wait and wait some more. Eventually, I think I would have started to wonder if, in fact, whoever made the promise maybe forgot that they made the promise, right? And that probably this wonderful thing or these wonderful things was never going to happen. Okay, to recap, Abraham and Sarah responded positively, positively to God's call. They pulled up their stakes, headed west, packed up the servants, and well, three chapters later and many, many, many years later, lots of things have happened to Abraham and Sarah. They had to move down to Egypt to get uh, away from a famine that was in the, uh, the, the land that they were there. They had returned and moved around until they could find at least a place to settle. And then they had to fight a war with some people who didn't want them as their neighbors. As you probably know, by this time, none of those three promises have been fulfilled by God. Zero. Zilch. Zip. They don't own an acre of land. They remain childless, and they haven't blessed anybody. In fact, they've caused a lot of trouble wherever they land. Well, God visits the couple one more time. Or again, I should say. And again, reaffirms his promise to bless them as he said before. But this time... Instead of just giving him his verbal commitment, God affirms this promise by making a covenant with Abraham and Sarah. Now the making of a covenant, actually the word is cutting of a covenant, which is the source of the phrase, let's cut a deal. The cutting of a covenant was a legal act, it was binding, it was very serious. The ritual was cool, if you're a kid probably, and really gross if you're not. Uh, you heard it described, Abraham had to kill a heifer, a goat, a ram, and then two birds. And the big animals, he had to saw in half. 
And then he had to put them pieces, one over here and one over here, one over there, one over there, one over there, one over there. What would that walkway be like by the time you drag those bloody carcasses over? It's going to be blood and guts everywhere, right? So this is the way it happened. A, uh, two kings or two queens or two business people would do this. They would offer the appropriate sacrifice and they would stand together on that walkway, walk through the bloody mess, and then they would say at the end something like this, may this or something worse happen to me if I fail to live up to my end of the agreement. That's what's called cutting a covenant, cutting a deal. Very serious implications for it, right? So in this story, if you were to have read it, um, Abraham gets everything ready and then he falls asleep. So he's, he's asleep when God's ready to make the covenant. So what passes through there? A smoking fire pot, which is a symbol of God. So God's the one who goes through and says, if I fail to live up to my end of the agreement, may this happen to me or worse if I don't see to it that all of these things come true. While Abraham is sleeping. What does that say? Does God really expect us to be able to live up to our word? I think God knows who we are, right? And that sometimes we'll do it and other times we won't. God knows that we're painfully human. And that sometimes we'll forget that we promised to love and serve the Lord. Or we'll, or we'll pretend that we forgot that we promised to love and serve the Lord. Or we'll simply break our promise to love and serve the Lord. But here's the secret of this whole bloody mess. It's the secret of God's love and God's grace is his son, Jesus Christ. In his son, Jesus Christ, God has taken care of all of that promise stuff. You can see on the screens another picture of a beautiful rainbow, but with one significant difference. Where the rainbow appears to touch the land, there we find not a pot of gold, but something far more precious, far more important to the gift of life, far more important to the gift of new life that we share in God. Truly, God has made the promise, God has taken care of the promise, and God promises to take care of you and me all because of Jesus' willingness to die on the cross. Isn't that a great surprise? A beautiful surprise. One that takes all of our promises, broken and kept, all of our stories, true and false, all of our attempts, both our successes and our failures, and makes them all good. Good for the glory of God, so that the world can be saved through Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Mm -hmm.